Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Sunny Go One Piece podcast. On this episode, we're going to talk about episodes four through six, or the equivalent of chapters one, and then chapters eight through fourteen. And this is because episode four is dedicated to Luffy's backstory. And as I mentioned in the past episode. This was originally the first thing in the manga, so this was actually chapter one, and so they put it here in episode four. So we get chapter one, and then we skip back ahead to chapters eight through fourteen in subsequent episodes five and six. And so, like last episode, we are going to give a synopsis of the episode, then some differences between the anime and the manga, and then my overall thoughts. Now this podcast is majority spoiler free because I want it to be for people who are getting into One Piece. But if you stick around for the spoiler stuff, that will be tacked on at the end. With that, let's dive in. So the synopsis for these three episodes. This is the episode we, where we finally get to see Luffy's backstory of how he met the red-haired Shanks. The men who would become the motivation and inspiration for him to become the pirate king, in addition to who he received the straw hat from, and where he gained his rubber powers from the Gomu Gomu no Mi devil fruit. We then cut back to the present, and Luffy is carried away by a bird, with Zoro giving chase to find themselves on an island under the control of the clown pirate Buggy. We're now formally introduced to Nami, and we see her try and trick and use Luffy to gain favor with Buggy to make off with a map to the Grand Line. This plan backfires on Nami, and Zoro has to come and save them, but he's wounded in the fight, and they have to escape. After getting away from Buggy, the trio meet a dog named Shushu, guarding a pet store for his past owner, and also the mayor of Orange Town, Boodle. Buggy and his henchman Moji tear through the pet store as well as a portion of the town using a massive cannon called the Buggy Ball. <laughs> it's a weird name. Um, Budo, fed up with Buggy taking away his treasured town and destroying it, decides to risk his life to fight Buggy for it. However, Luffy decides to step in and help the mayor and take on Buggy himself. That's kind of the gist of these three episodes. Now for some of the differences between the anime and the manga. There aren't very many of them actually in these three episodes. One of the big ones in the flashback with Luffy's past is that we don't get to see Luffy stab his eye in the very beginning of the flashback, like in the manga. That's actually the very first page. Is Luffy standing on top of、um, a couple crates and he <laughs> stabs his eye with a knife, or just below his eye with a knife? That's actually where that scar comes from. If you look closely at Luffy's、um, face on his left. Under his left eye, you see a scar, and that's actually where it comes from. And because they don't show this to you, you you really don't know where that scar comes from. But that's where it comes from. He he essentially just stabs his eye to, to show how tough he is to the other pirates because he wants to go with his shanks to become a pirate. But this yeah just serves to show just how reckless and how serious he was in becoming a pirate, but also how immature he is at the same time. It's actually very good, efficient character development. Another curious thing we don't get to see in the anime is Luffy all grown up and setting out on his journey, where he says goodbye to everyone in the town, including Makino and the mayor, and also facing down the Sea King that takes Shanks's arm and beating the living shit out of it this time.、Um, We do kind of get to see this moment in the opening theme, actually. So in in the theme song "We Are," you see him punch the Sea King, and that's actually the Sea King that that attacks him and Shanks, and it ultimately ends up biting off Shanks's arm. But I do find it weird that they don't put this back in anywhere.、Uh, the flashback actually just cuts off right when Shanks gives. Uh, Luffy the hat, and he sails away. But there's actually a couple more chap or pages in the manga to show show this moment, as well as <laughs> how he gets sucked into a whirlpool and has to dive into a barrel. And that's why we see him in a barrel at the very beginning when Kobe finds him. But aside from these two things, these episodes are adapted really faithfully.、Um, to be honest, that there really isn't many other changes. So let's move into my overall thoughts on these episodes. And that would be I love these episodes. This is the part that really made me fall in love with One Piece originally. And I've got one word, or I guess two words for you: Shushu, Shushu. Oh man, yeah, 
Anyways, I'll get to that. But before that, I want to touch on Luffy's flashback a little bit. So Luffy's flashback is great at establishing Luffy and also adding some depth to him, which is why it kind of sucks that the anime doesn't start off with this, as it paints Luffy originally as the shallow simpleton who's kind of stupid in the in the very first few episodes. But you do get to get a sense that Luffy does have a deeper sense of responsibility and some maturity after this flashback. As I mentioned in the last po- podcast, we also get our first explanation of what a devil fruit is here. We learn that it's a mysterious fruit that when eaten gives the person that ate it fantastical abilities, but at the cost of being weakened by the sea and losing the ability to swim in seawater. Luffy obviously eats the gum gum no mi or the gum gum fruit, as we've already established previously. Luffy's origin, while interesting, the more interesting part about this is the character of Shanks and his crew. Shanks and his importance to the overall story has always been an intriguing thing because of how much we don't know, and also what we do know. Like, the very little that we do know is interesting. Shanks is definitely portrayed to be one of the end goals of the series, in addition to the One Piece. As Luffy has promised to return the straw hat to him, he's also portrayed to be incredibly strong as he can just intimidate a Sea King monster by looking at it. It really makes you wonder where Shanks fits into their overall world and just how strong he really is. Because he comes off as sort of a middling strength. Like, he's strong, but his personality makes it seem like he's not that strong because he doesn't have this sort of imposing, intimidating aura around him. He's very much like Luffy in that... There's a lot more to him that we just don't know. And I think one of my favorite moments with Shanks is easily the part where he laughs off being humiliated by Higuma the Bandit at the tavern. This part is, to this day, always stuck with me. And I think back to this scene, anytime I ever feel like I'm getting insulted or getting made fun of, it's taught me to just let it slide off me, and I almost never get pissed off at stuff like that anymore. Like Shanks, you know, I like to pick my battles and only get angry when it's something important or worth fighting for. But I remember watching this scene, and I always think back to this particular scene and just think, yeah, it's not a big deal. Like, so what? And that has saved me a lot of stress and a lot of just unnecessary expenditure of energy. Now, before we get to the point I made at the beginning, can we just talk about how badass Zoro is already? I mean, we're only about five episodes into it, and he comes in to save Nami, gets stabbed in a fight with Buggy, then instead of abandoning Luffy in the cage, while even while Luffy is telling Zoro to leave him and save himself, he lifts up Luffy and the concrete cage he, he's in, which given how strong physically Zoro is and how much he's struggling seemingly the cage weighs like almost a literal ton. The music here and Nami's reaction to seeing not not necessarily Zoro's stupid strength, but that these two quote-unquote evil pirates are both willing to sacrifice each other to save the other, add on top the already goosebump-inducing moment here, which, yeah, I, re- I really love this moment. It's a great moment that makes me really like all three of the main characters a little bit more. Now, getting back to my favorite moment, and like I mentioned, this is the part that convinced me that One Piece was something special, and it's the dog, Shushu. So, I know in the romanization spelling and in the subtitles, it's spelled C-H-O-U-C-H-O-U, and so it's sound, it's spelled like it's supposed to be sound Chuchu, and I don't know if that's actually how it's pronounced in the English dub, but in Japanese, it's, it's pronounced Shushu, like S-H-U-S-H-U, and that's how I've always known him, so that's what I'm going to refer to him as from here on out. And and the, actually, the C-H-O-U-C-H-O-U spelling is canon in the Japanese, too. There's actually a reference to that much later on, on how his name is actually spelled. And so that is correct. But when you say it, it sounds like Shushu. So I'm just going to keep calling him Shushu. I love how we were in- introduced to him as this unassuming dog that doesn't seem like anything other than a bit character, especially as his first interaction with Luffy is pretty comedic, as he just bites Luffy's entire face and it's pretty funny but there's a lot more to this loyal dog. The part with Shushu is just heartbreaking but also heartwarming all at the same time. This I feel like is the first real example of how damn good Oda is at building up a story thread and getting you so quickly emotionally invested in caring about the well-being of his characters and this dog in particularly we just met. 
and as well as his pet store. He does this by taking the time to develop Shushu and his backstory. It's crazy to me that I could tell you who Shushu is and what kind of character he is just based on that short backstory better than I can with some feature-length movie pr- main protagonists. When you see his pet shop burning, oh, I felt so much for him. Like, you just want to see Luffy beat the living shit out of Moji and Richie. Um, and that punch is so satisfying when Luffy goes and fights him off. And the funny thing is, or the great thing is, is that this is only the first of, like, satisfying Luffy punches. <laughs> In the future, there are some really, really great like just one shot kills that Luffy does. But yeah, just seeing seeing him bark at, at his pet shop and just how heartbroken he is and the tears coming down of Shushu's face. Like I was like, oh my God, this is so sad. But then I also really love the moment that Luffy comes back, not only having beat Moji and Richie, but that he comes back with the last box of pet food for Shushu. And like... I don't know, just thinking about it now even kind of is a little bit teary for me. But leading into that, I also really like this scene because it begins Nami's early character growth too. When we meet her, she's completely distrustful and downright hates pirates because of something that's happened to her in the past. She not only begins to see that not all pirates are bad after Luffy gives Shushu the, the pet food and figures out that he di- he went after Moji because of shushu but she begins to warm on luffy a bit after seeing that he's actually different from the pirates she's accustomed to seeing it's also interesting here too as there's a bit of world building and character development because it's hinted that something happened to nami outside of the main story and we become really curious as to what made her so resentful of pirates and it's just another plot thread you can't wait to actually learn more about at least i know i found myself really intrigued by that because it's such a big focus on Nami's character at this point. She mentions it quite a few times how she hates pirates. The other thing I really love about these early episodes is the comedy is so freaking funny. And not to say that more recent episodes aren't funny, but there's less opportunities for them because the stakes are so much higher and and they're so much more serious. But to this day, I still laugh at most of the jokes in these early episodes especially with our first major villain, Buggy. Technically, Morgan was the first villain, but he was such a pushover. I don't really count him. He's more like a mini-boss. But Buggy is our first villain with a devil fruit power, and he's bestowed with the chop-chop fruit, or the barabara no mi. And I love Buggy as a character and as a villain. There's just so much more to him in terms of motivation, personality, and fighting style than Morgan ever had. And he's just really fun to watch. Also, his self-consciousness of his big nose... (laughs) <laughs> and him misunderstanding his subordinates is just absolutely hilarious. It's such a funny gag. And unfortunately, since these jokes are word plays in Japanese, some of it is lost in translation a bit. I will say they do do an admirable job in trying to capture the essence of the subtitles. In one exchange, they try but kind of fail because it's pretty impossible. The part I'm talking about is where the underling says, you have it all wrong, and Buggy mishears it as huge and all red, which sound almost nothing alike. Um, but in but in Japanese, the underling says, Mataku na gokai desu, and Buggy hears, Akapana de dekai desu. The word for completely, which is matakuna, sounds a lot like akapana, which is red nose. And then the word gokai, meaning misunderstanding, sounds very much like dekai, which is big. So then you get that, Akapana de dekai desu, which is absolutely gold. I laughed so hard, I, even to this day when I saw that joke. And I've seen that scene like a million times, and I'm still laughing at it. So yeah, just kind of a bit of Japanese wordplay trivia for you. I also like the random small gags like Nami politely bowing and apolo- apologizing just for beating down one of Buggy's underlings, similarly to how Luffy bows and politely apologizes to Morgan for breaking a statue, as if something like that is enough to appease these villains. <laughs> Let's say I want to talk about the kind of the overall themes introduced in these couple episodes. And the theme of treasure is very prevalent in this story arc on Orange Island. Even right from the get-go, this is the first time we see Luffy get pissed. And each time, it's when a treasure is threatened. Whether it's his straw hat, Shushu's pet store being destroyed, or when the town is attacked on behalf of Mayor Boodle. 
I like that it highlights that Luffy is not just this one-dimensional simpleton who's just happy-go-lucky all the time. There are things that he cares about and gets passionate about, and that's when his friends or people's treasures get disrespected or threatened. And obviously that's a callback to his lesson learned with Shanks in the bar. Another thing is we also start to see the definition of what treasure is is very fluid. This is obviously not an original concept to One Piece or a deep observation on my part, but Oda does implant in your head that treasure can mean a variety of things to different people. Obviously, we have, you know, financial treasure in in the traditional sense with Nami and Buggy seeing gold and riches as treasure. But then we also see that the straw hat is Luffy's treasure, something completely meaningless to most, but is very valuable to him. And of course, the town is Mayor Budo's treasure. And then the pet shop is Shushu's treasure. And so we see what treasure means to a variety of different people. And my theory is, is that this is Oda's way of priming us that the One Piece is not strictly going to be a treasure in the traditional sense, as Gold Roger had stated. And that is most definitely something else. What that is, who knows? I have my theories. That was pretty much episodes four through six. Kind of considered the transition or the second act of this arc, but still packed full of great moments and easily one of the defining moments of the series for me personally. I still remember reading that portion of the manga in bed and just thinking, oh my god, this is so amazing. I need to read more. And at the time, I only had the first three volumes because I had borrowed them from my friend. And I, I I had to go out and buy the next four the next day. All in all, these episodes really help to set the tone of the series in many respects going forward, be it the tension building, the comedy, the emotional core, characters, and world building. I love that we get to know our main characters much more with Luffy's backstory and her introduction to Nami, as well as some cool moments for Zoro. So next episode, we're getting into the climax of the Orange Town arc, which I'm looking forward to a bunch just because the fighting starts here with some epic moments as well as really funny gags. And a kind of big reveal, too. But before we get to the spoiler section, I just wanted to say I really appreciate you taking the time out to listen to this in a sea of podcasts. And if you enjoyed this, send me a like or comment. And if you want to join me on this journey of rewatching One Piece, please consider subscribing. Oh, and I do have an Instagram and Twitter account now at Podcast. If you want updates of when I post new episodes or see some pictures of my manga collection, please check those out. As well as for now, I guess the Instagram comment section can be a place to leave comments or criticisms until I figure out a better way to do that. But with that said, I will see you next time. Thanks. Bye. Alright, so spoiler sections. I find this really interesting. This is starts the trend of Oda faking us out with the possible uh, devil fruit with telekinetic powers, but it always turns out to be something else. So we get to see Buggy's Barabara no Mi powers, and as he lifts one of his underlings sort of through the air without us seeing how he's doing it when he's first introduced. And this is something he would go on to use with Robin, with her Hanahana no Mi, as well as with Doflamingo, with his Ito Ito no Mi. And we, each time, he teases somebody with telekinetic powers, but then it turns out to be something else entirely. So, yeah, it's kind of like a weird gag that he keeps throwing out there. I found that really interesting. And I, I gotta think we're eventually going to get a sort of telekinetic power. I don't know what it would be called. What, what would it be called? Like tere tere no mi, like telekinetic, something like that. And then the other big thing I wanted to talk about was this is the first instance of Conqueror's Haki or Haoshoku no Haki with Shanks protecting Luffy, which is insane to think that Oda had this ability in mind so far back. Or it was an amazingly convenient retcon. Either way, it surprises the hell out of me and how it retroactively explains what Shanks did there to scare the Sea King off so much. I mean... Haoshoku or Conqueror's Haki, I mean, it was definitely a concept when Shanks meets up with Whitebeard, even though it wasn't named Haki yet. Clearly, that's what he was doing to all of Whitebeard's crew when they all start fainting. And then it doesn't even get properly named until towards the end of the, the midway point, just before the time skip, when Rayleigh teaches Luffy about Haki. 
actually no it appears in amazon lily when uh boa notices luffy doing the conqueror's hockey but either way i mean that's still hundreds of episodes away that's like 400 episodes before he actually names that and we actually connect the dots that this is what shanks was doing which is insane to me Another thing I often see brought up about this scene is what we know of just how buff Shanks is. I mean, even at this point, how did he get his arm taken off? You would think someone as strong as Shanks, who is a Yonko or an emperor of the sea. I mean, these guys are beastly strong. Like, because we now know that Whitebeard, Blackbeard, Big Mom, and Kaido are all just absolute monstrous strength and shanks is considered one of them and we know that even at this point he is on the level of mihawk at least because mihawk obviously comments on the fact that they used to have duels and they were pretty much on even playing field now obviously mihawk mihawk is not a yonko level but he's at least a shibukai level you know so he's a warlord level so he's damn powerful so why does he get his arm taken off by just some sea king Well, the real world answer from what I've read in articles is that Oda's editors at Jump asked him to change that to make it more exciting. But I also think in in the story, though, Shanks saw this potential in Luffy, but saw that he was just this brash, reckless. And as we see with the eye stabbing and the picking the fight with the bandits by himself. And if Luffy was going to be a great pirate, he needed to mature and learn that there are tough consequences and sacrifices that need to be made if you're going to make it as a pirate. And so I think this was a conscious decision so that he could help Luffy grow. And he does grow up after this. As when Shanks is about to leave, he no longer asks him to go with him and learns that he has some growing up to do and learning before he can call himself a pirate and so yeah i that's what i choose to believe because otherwise it just makes no sense whatsoever that shanks would ever let a sea king bite his arm off given how strong we know shanks is and you know the crazy thing is we still don't really know how strong shanks actually is i think that's one of the biggest mysteries is what what makes shanks so strong because he clearly doesn't have a devil fruit and so he's just buff. I mean, the other three Yonko all have devil fruits. Or I guess the other four. I mean, White Beard had one. Black Beard has two. Big Mom has one. And Kaido has one. So Shanks is actually very unique in the sense that he's just strong physically. He's like Zoro in a sense. But yeah, I'm very much looking forward to, to that. And also just, yeah, just his relationship with Buggy. But I'll get into that more on the next episode. Anyways... That's kind of like the spoiler things I wanted to talk about. But yeah, if you stuck around, thanks for listening, and I will see you on the next episode.